Uh, welcome to New America. My name is Andres Martinez. I am the editorial director and, and vice president here at New America. And uh, thank you for coming. I'm very excited to have a conversation about Mexico today and a lot of the d recent developments in Mexico and how Mexico is uh, going through a period of uh, very interesting transition um, with two people who are incredibly um, well qualified to speak to uh, the latest in Mexico and what it means for the bilateral relationship uh, and for the future of North America as well as for the Mexican people who have endured a period of a 20 years now since NAFTA went into effect of, of wrenching change. Some, much of it positive, some of it uh, very dislocating and, and with some uh, negative costs associated to it and of course the security picture that we've all heard about so much. Um, so I just want to quickly introduce um, Shannon O'Neill, who's a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and the author of Two Nations Indivisible, Mexico, the U.S., and the Road Ahead. And to her right, Alfredo Corchado, who's a bureau chief for the Dallas Morning News in Mexico City and the author of, you can hold it up, oh. Midnight in Mexico. <laughs> I just uh, bought it because that's a great price. So <laughs> I, I have to say, uh, I, I'm, always, I'm often frustrated when I read coverage of Mexico in, in American media and even books that come out. And we're very fortunate that this year we had two great books come out on, about Mexico uh, written by our two guests today um, earlier this year. And so we have the books available. And uh, Shannon and Alfredo would be happy to sign them for you as well. Um, just a, a, on a quick personal note, I grew up in Chihuahua, northern Mexico, and uh, I, was, I had the uh, privilege of going back there in May. I was invited to give a talk at the university, and I hadn't been to Chihuahua in a number of years, though I, I get to Mexico City more often. Um, and I was just amazed at how the city of Chihuahua, which is about a four-hour drive, as many of you probably know, south of El Paso, Texas, it's the capital of the state of Chihuahua. So I grew up in Chihuahua, Chihuahua. And I was amazed at how much the city has grown and prospered. And I, I used to go to a school that was sort of on the edge of the city, behind which was just an open sierra. And now behind that, you keep going, and there's a Wendy's, and there's a Chili's, and then you hit another highway. And there's a whole part of the city that didn't exist when I was a kid. And OK, I'm not too young, but I'm also not that old. Um, and that whole part of the city looks like you know, Houston or something. It's just, it's just boomed unbelievably. At the same time, though, you know, talking to friends that I hadn't seen in many years that I went to junior high um, with, it was very sad to hear you know, them say that you know, the childhood of their kids is so different from the childhood we had just because, you know, as, 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 as you all probably know, the state of Chihuahua has been racked by, vi with, you know, by violence in the last decade uh, plus uh, with the drug war. Uh, <laughs> it's you know, situated right in, in the place where Ciudad Juarez is the other big city in the state of Chihuahua, the border city, um, that's been sort of in the front lines of the drug war. So the security situation in the city I grew up in has been horrific for years now. Um, and it's, you know, when I was a kid, it was an incredibly tranquil place. I mean, there was a drug trade and, you, you know, people knew that in the Sierra things were happening. But this city, you know, but that was a different era. And the city was, was very tranquil. And when I was a kid, we would hop on buses and go downtown. And, you know, parents never worried about where we were or anything. It's, it's so different. But I, and I was struck at how these, these sort of two phenomenon and changes that I was aware of um, on this, well, people were talking about crime and security, and and yet the economic growth that was palpable, and and the the commerce that was available to people now, as opposed to when I was a kid. Um, I think those those speak to sort of some of the twin realities that we wrestle with in the states when we try to make sense of what's happening in Mexico, this place that in some ways has become, this, you know, a nation that's become incredibly vulnerable to organized crime. But there's also this story about the explosion of the middle class um, and economic development, which has its, its, its flaws and it, isn't, it hasn't been a perfect transition. Uh, but these t twin narratives are sometimes hard for us to reconcile. Um, and in the last you know, five years or so, I felt that the coverage in the American media of Mexico might have been too negative and it had been too sort of one-sided 
Um, and I think there's been a big corrective of, in that in the last year or so, uh, I think starting with the election last year, to a point where now I, I some days worry that, that maybe the, the view is too rosy-eyed. Uh, there was a there was a good there was a good front page story in the New York Times on Sunday which suggests that you know Mexico is now the land of opportunity and and anybody who was born in Mexico should return and migrants should go to Mexico and so I feel like maybe I should go back and open a, a taqueria or something <laughs> uh, taqueria Nueva America right uh, but before doing so I was really eager to have this event so uh, but it, so enough about me, but that's, that's kind of where, where I'm coming at this. And as I wrestle with these twin narratives of Mexico, I find that, that the work of, of both Shannon and Alfredo has, is really uh, at the forefront of some of the more nuanced, uh, uh, wisest commentary on Mexico. And all that said, I hope the two of you will disagree on, on, <laughs> on a few matters. Um, but Shannon, maybe we should start with you in terms of talking about the economic transformation that's occurred in Mexico since um, NAFTA, which is, you know, we're coming up on the 20th anniversary. Um, and against that backdrop, we have the election of Enrique Peña Nieto, uh, the return of the PRI, a return that was, you know, probably in some ways facilitated by unease with the security mm -hmm. situation. But he took office um, last December. And in his first year, he has not been shy about taking on a lot of big challenges. And we read about the education reform, energy reform, um, and he's, uh, you know, the labor market reform and taking on some of the, uh, the competition issues. So if you could just give a, paint a little, uh, a picture for us of what Peña Nieto has been up to and, and how it, it, it uh, coincides with the transformation that has occurred in Mexico in the mm -hmm. last 20 years. So a small question to start sure. off. Sure. Just, you know, well, let me talk a bit about the, the real transformation of Mexico's economy over the last couple decades. And then now that Penny is in where he where he kind of comes into this. And I would say if you look at Mexico, there's sort of three big changes that have happened economically if you look back over the last few decades. And one of the big changes is structural. So if you looked at the Mexican economy in the early 1980s, this was an economy that was closed to the United States and the world. Uh, it had high tariffs, it had subsidies, it had quotas, it had hundreds and hundreds of state-owned enterprises. Uh, and about the only thing it sent abroad was oil. It dominated exports. Uh, you fast forward to today, Mexico is one of the most open economies in the world. It has free trade agreements with 44 nations, more than almost any other country. And on measures of openness, things like trade to GDP, it far outpaces the United States or Brazil, and it even rivals China. I mean, this is an incredibly open economy today. And in this openness, it's not dominated by commodities, which places like Brazil or Peru or Chile are. It is dominated by manufactured goods. So you know, three out of every four dollars of things that go abroad are manufactured goods, so not commodities. It's a very different place than it was you know, 30 years ago. Structurally, it's made this transition from this agricultural and commodity-based economy to a manufacturing and services-dominated economy. And that's, that's a fundamental difference. A second big shift we've seen in Mexico economically over the last couple of decades is the rise of consumption and the rise of a middle class. So Mexico has also made a transition from a very poor country to a more middle class nation. And you know, when you think about Mexico, you traditionally think of have and have nots. You think of tens of millions of poor people and then Carlos Slim. All of those exist in Mexico. But in addition to those two extremes is now 40, 50, 60 million people that can be considered middle class. They own their own car. They own their own home. They have a cell phone. They have lots of appliances. Many of their kids go to private school. This is a huge change. And you see it economically in the numbers. So you see consumption as a growing part of GDP. But you see it in the economy itself. And so the variety of retail, mm -hmm. of, of the different options that are there. You're starting to see it politically, too, because yeah. this was the force that kicked the PRI out in 2000 and turned to Fox and then Calderon. And then it's the group that actually turned and brought the pre rec in with Benny Nieto just a year ago. So this is an important aspect of economically and then increasingly politically. And then the final shift I want to mention economically, because it's important for Mexico, but increasingly important for us, is U.S.-Mexico economic ties. And so we've always been linked economically because of the border, because of oil and other things. But the nature of those ties have fundamentally transformed since NAFTA. So the amount of trade going back and forth now is half a trillion dollars every year. So it's quadrupled since NAFTA came into effect. Um, but probably more important than the amount to me 
is what is traded. And so today, rather than oil coming north and finished goods going south, what is traded is pieces and parts. Because what's happening today is integration of manufacturing, or we make things together. So for something that's coming in from Mexico, so quote unquote made in Mexico, on average today, 40% of that product was actually, or the value out of that product was made in the United States. And there's no other country that comes near to that for the United States. So China, or the European Union, or Brazil, it's 4%. And even Canada, our other NAFTA partner, it's only 25%. So Mexico, by far and above, is important for us in the way we actually produce things today. And that is fundamentally different than it was when we were thinking about signing NAFTA. So all of those changes that have happened and made Mexico's economy a very different place. Um, now, Penny Nieto, he's come in. Uh, despite all these changes, which I say almost all of them are good changes, Mexico hasn't been known for stellar growth over the last 10 years, right? It's been stable, but pretty unspectacular in terms of GDP growth. And so this president came in trying to break that gridlock. And so for all the good things that have happened in Mexico's economy, it still has a lot of problems. It has lots of monopolies and oligopies that make many, many sectors, and beyond telecommunications or media, many sectors uncompetitive and not open to entrepreneurs, to new ideas. Uh, it has a paucity of financing. So if you're a small, medium-sized company, or even a semi-big company, and you want to get financing to open a new plant or hire new workers, it's, it's almost impossible to get. Uh, it has a lot of other types of barriers. It has a very weak transportation system. It needs new roads. It needs new ports. It needs new airports. It needs more crossings at the border to make it competitive. And it needs to work on its education system, because as Mexico's moved out of the low-cost producer to, uh, to a less low-cost producer, how do you compete? Well, you compete with human capital. You compete with innovation. And they haven't been able to keep up with those needs in their economy. So there's lots to do. Uh, and that's where Penny has tried to come in and say, OK, where are the barriers today that we can take this economy? And now that we're 20 years from NAFTA, where do we go now to make it better for everyone? Okay. <laughs> that was a great <coughs> overview of what's, what's, uh, what's been occurring. Um, and I want to come back to some of the, the specifics of the reforms. Um, but on further, why don't you bring us up to date also on the other side of the Mexico story. Um, and then I also want both of you to engage on, on, on both of them. But just one of the things that Peña Nieto has wanted to do, and I think with some success, is change the subject. There's a perception that his predecessor, uh, President Calderón, was sort of single-mindedly focused and maybe even obsessed with the taking on the cartels. You know, we, you could say, obviously, for understandable reasons, or maybe the strategy was, but, but, for what, but, but he took it very personally, seems to be the, the consensus. And that, you know, when you, when you heard from the Presidencia in Mexico for the last six years before Peña Nieto arrived, chances are it was, it was about the war on drugs. Peña Nieto comes in and says, you know, I'm going to have my interior minister deal with that, and I'm going to talk about other things. Um, and yet, obviously, ta changing the subject and changing perceptions isn't the same as changing realities. How is this war on, against organized crime and the cartels, uh, which you write about so evocatively in your book, and as a, as a very uh, courageous foreign correspondent in Mexico, uh, you bumped up against quite a bit in trying to cover that story. But give us sort of an update of where things stand um, as we've made the transition from Calderón to Peña Nieto. Well, <coughs> it's difficult to come after Shannon. <laughs> uh, first, I want to thank Andres and the New America Foundation for, for the opportunity. I think I was one of these uh, many reporters, many foreign correspondents in Mexico who really welcomed the change. I think uh, if you talk to journalists in Mexico, you would see that many of us probably have PTS, what's the word, PTSD or something? PTSD. Uh, having covered the drug war for the last uh, 10 years now, more than 100,000 mm -hmm. people kill just in the last six years or, or disappear. So when Peña Nieto comes in in July of last year, um, many of us really applauded the effort to, to try to change the subject because, let's face it, I think a lot of people on this side and in Mexico are, are tired of, of the headlines. They're tired of bodies dangling, of headless corpses, etc. cetera. Um, I would say, though, that... <coughs> If you look at the headlines in the last few months, the elephant is very much there, uh, especially if you look since May to the present. It's almost impossible to kind of try to put the genie back in the bottle. Um, and yet having said that, I mean, uh, you, you have the, the, the government will tell you that, uh, that the murder rate is down by about 20%. 
But you look at surveys and polls throughout Mexico, and people still feel very insecure. The security remains the big, the big problem. Um, it having said that, I, I think Peñaito has done a pretty good job. Uh, since July, he's captured the four, the four leaders of the top cartels. Um, Ramiro Trevino from the Gulf Cartel, Mayito from the uh, Sinaloa in, in the Juarez region. And then these two names, I mean, the, the um, La, Betty La Fea, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Betty La Fea, it, who's uh, in charge of the Juarez cartel in, in the Juarez area, and Zeta Cuarenta, the guy who made a lot of people's life miserable, including my life miserable, he's, he's been captured. Uh, so, so the, the, you know, they haven't really done a big deal like the previous administration in, in showcasing these, these arrests, but, but they're there. Yet, I think the, the, the violence has really changed from one location to another. I mean, it's no longer Ciudad Juarez. In fact, I think Ciudad Juarez is now much, much better, much safer than it was before. I, I, I think at one point it was over 100, 100,000 people living now. It's, uh, I just saw the numbers the other day. It's something like 30. So that's, that's uh, decreased significantly. significantly. You look at places like Nuevo Laredo, which uh, to a lot of people is still one of the most dangerous cities, and yet people are, f are feeling excited about Nuevo Laredo. They just elected uh, a bond government there for the first time. Uh, businesses are talking about going back to the city and, and reopening businesses. Um, and, and, and then you look at other places like uh, Estado de Mexico, Guerrero, Michoacán, and the rise of the self-defense groups. And that's, that's been, a, a, I think, a big, big challenge. And that's taken away from, from the new narrative. So if you talk to the government, uh, they will say, you know, give us a year, maybe a little longer, uh, but the situation is, is improving. I don't really get that sense from talking to people on the streets uh, <coughs> in certain regions. I, I, I still see that people are very, very concerned about that. I mean, you still have mothers who are Facebooking one another and saying, you know, can my kid come out at, uh, on the street and play? Uh, people still so, uh, trying to use social media. There are still regions in Mexico where, where reporters <coughs> continue to self-censor themselves, be forced to self-censor because of threats, because of violence, etc. So I think it's, it's still a mixed bag. I wish, and just to give an example, I mean, I've been working on the story for now for months now, trying to look at the other Mexico. Because there is a, a more prosperous Mexico, there is another side to Mexico. There's a place called... El Bajio, for example, where they have the aerospace industry that's growing <coughs> and, and, and many other plants. We're looking for, um, just to give you an example, we're looking at a story, North Texas and El Bajio. That's, it's one labor market for generations, and we're trying to figure out what is, the, what is the future of that one labor market. If less people are coming across the border, what happens to Texas? What happens to North Texas? And one of the things that struck me, for example, was the, uh, the number of people I interviewed in, in Querétaro, San Luis, uh, San Luis Potosí, Guanajuato would say, you know, I still think about going to, Mac to the United States like my father or like my grandfather, but more out of curiosity than out of necessity. And, you, and then you look at other states like Zacatecas and Durango who are trying to emulate the model that Querétaro is using, that they're attracting aerospace. And in those two in instances, I talked to executives who said, yes, we tried to duplicate the same scenario, but within weeks, we had organized crime calling us and asking us for extortions, for monthly extortions. Uh, so that's kind of the mixed bag in, in Mexico. One of the... Um, so I guess that's one area where we can disagree. We yeah, no, can disagree it, on three points. And it was interesting <laughs> that the, the change of subject has occurred on both sides of the border. I mean, it's almost been this concerted effort um, in terms of the bilateral relationship to de-emphasize security. Um, and Vice President Biden was in Mexico last week, and uh, it was almost humorous, the fact that he kept talking publicly if, about the fact that he wasn't talking about security. Well, I guess if you're talking about how you're not talking about it, you're sort of talking about it. But... But there's been this concerted effort to make the relationship be more about yeah. economic engagement and, and even education and other, all the, I, I used to joke that it was uh, any subject starting with the letter E because it was energy, education, economy, anything not being security, 
um, I, I'm, I'm sure it came up in some of the private discussions. When Peña Nieto first came in, um, and you read about this, Alfredo, and we talked about it on one occasion, the, the pre-government said, whoa, all of this, all, you know, this level of cooperation that had been occurring between U.S. security agencies and law enforcement and, and, and Mexican agencies is a little bit more than we are comfortable with. And let's, let's go back to setting some boundaries here in terms of Mexican sovereignty. Um, I don't have a sense of how that's really kind of played out in recent months. And, and you've talked about the fact that there continue to be some you know, milestones achieved in the fight against the cartels. But is this occurring with lesser degree of, of cooperation between um, our law enforcement and Mexican agencies? Or was a lot of that more sort of rhetorical and the, and the cooperation is still there? Oh, that's, that's a great question. I mean, I was, I've been here the, the last couple of days trying to get answers to those questions. And, and it's interesting. In Mexico City, no one, no one wants to talk about security. And in D.C., it's the same story. I mean, very few people want to talk about security. It's almost like, you know, let's just, uh, let's just leave it alone. And then you ask about the cooperation between both countries. Uh, people in Mexico City and D.C. will insist that, yes, there are new channels that they're, that they're using, uh, cumbersome, bureaucratic, et cetera. But, yeah, you talk to people on, on, on the border in on Mexico, uh, El Paso, Laredo, and they will say, you know, we're, we're still cooperating and on an informal basis. We're still calling people one-on-one. -on -one. And it was interesting when, uh, when Trevino Morales was, was captured in, uh, in Nuevo Laredo on July 16th, I think. Um, it, it was interesting to talk to Americans who were in the know along the border in that, in that region, who knew kind of the details about what had happened and who kind of lead you to believe that maybe they were, not that they were there, but that they were much closer than, than maybe we thought they were. And I floated that s story to people in Gobernacion, people in Mexico City, and they all shot it down. And it was very nationalistic. And you talk to people on, on the American side in D.C., they shot it down. So there, you know, there, there are basically like three realities. And, and who do you believe? I, I tend to believe people on the border, uh, people on the ground. So I, I think that, uh, that it's still going on, but it's much more informally, much more unofficial, you know, that, that kind of cooperation. But there is that s the sense in Mexico City, and you're, I mean, as we talked about, that the Americans were not only in the kitchen, but had become the chefs. And there, there was, they had to find a polite way to say, you know, goodbye. We loved your cooking, but it's time to go to Shannon, a Shannon, what's, what's your sense of how this collaboration mm -hmm. well, you know is evolving? Well, you know what I think is pretty striking is the juxtaposition of the economic policy side and the security side, and particularly in the bilateral part. And, and you look at this first almost year, what, 10 months of the Peña Nieto administration, and on the economic side, they are, you know, cohesive, they are ambitious, they have the ear of the president, and they are getting stuff done. So, you know, they had a labor reform, then they had an education reform, then they had an amparo reform, then they had a, you know, introduced a financial reform that's working its way through. Now they have an energy reform. They got the secondary legislation done for education. I mean, they're just going and they have fiscal right. reform, and that's going to be done by October 20th, and they're, you know, they're just knocking these things off. And they're very tight and, and moving in lockstep together. And then you they turn the, the administration, the Peña Nieto administration. Right. So the finance minister and, 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 and the others. And they have the backing of, of and the Pan and, and, and they have the full backing of the president and then the Pacto de Mexico. So the, the other parties are all working very closely on this. Right. Uh, and then you turn to the security issues and uh, the policy just announced by the government, and we'll turn to the U.S. part of it, but the policy is much more vague. Uh, when the leaders of this group come out, um, they're s at times conflicting in, in the way they're describing what they're doing. Uh, it's much less clear what they're going to do just on their own and how they're going to present it and what the policies are. Uh, and, and the traction or the concrete programs that you might expect to come out of 10 months of being in government, there's very little to show for it. You right? know, it's interesting uh, uh, that you bring up the policy because I've been asking people on both sides, what is what the is policy? What is it? Nobody can tell you, right? <laughs> but I, finally f I found uh, a new explanation, which I think makes sense, you know, and that was someone in, in Mexico City that echoes in D.C., which was the policy is to really root out the problem and to do the uh, uh, economic reforms, you know, whether it's uh, telecom, fiscal, 
so that we can get the country growing again. And that's really the policy, to try to create jobs so that uh, people become less of a target for cartels, for, uh, recruiting efforts, and so forth. And I said, but what is the policy on the ground? He said, well, you know, give us at least a year, maybe a little more. Uh, but I haven't really seen much of a I mean, change. I think the problem is that, and I've, right, talking to people, I've heard this on their side as well. We're, right, we're focusing on this, and then we're going to turn to security. But you don't have that luxury, uh, frankly, if you're, if you're a president or if you're administration. You have to handle more than one thing at a time. And to, so to what extent is, is Peña Nieto be benefiting from a lot of the investments and efforts made by Calderon to, to, and the country um, in those years to build up capacity, whether it's, you know, l state, uh, you know, law enforcement at the state level or deployment of federal police and some, I guess, modest moves towards reforming the judiciary or is that, or is there still kind of a gap between the, the capacity needed by the state to really take this on, uh, sp especially on the, on the judicial side where I think everybody agrees. Um, and even I noticed Vice President Biden couldn't help himself when his press conference in Mexico, he, he threw something about that. And, um, but wh where are we in the gap? I mean, I think it was very clear that early on in the Calderon tenure, there was just a lack of capacity to handle the, the problem, both the security problem in the law enforcement sense, but also as a rule of law matter on the judicial side. And how far are we from being able to, cl or Mexico, to close that gap? It's, it's still pretty far. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they are still in the process of reforming the judicial system, which, if it happens, will come online in 2016. Some places have moved forward, and there have been, you know, when you look at some of the statistics from Chihuahua or other places, actually, uh, cases get solved faster, and more serious cases are actually taken because they can prioritize. Under the old system, you can't prioritize <coughs> which cases. So a murder or somebody who stole you know, a bag of chips, they both have to be treated equally. And now under the new system, you can actually prioritize and go after the cases that are more important. Um, so some of those things are, are good. But, um, but one, it hasn't been spread broadly. And two, they're still in the baby steps. They're learning. It's a totally new system. And, and unfortunately, some of these early pilot, pilot places like Chihuahua the new system was coming to place just as the violence was escalating. So some people mm -hmm. associate, well, it's a new justice system, and, right. and that caused the violence rather than not. So I think that issue, it's, this government has said it's going to push it forward. And once it gets through the economic reforms, that will be on its agenda. But, but, but the clock is ticking. And I would say on the capacity side, if you looked at Calderon's administration, where capacity was built was at the federal level mm -hmm. and in the federal police, but not much at the state right. and local level. And so that will be the fundamental challenge for this government. Can they keep the federal level, but then turn to the state and local level? And I would say it's been slow so far in getting, getting going. There was a, a poll out uh, this morning in uh, Animal Politico that said something like 30% of all Mexicans would rather get rid of the local police, the state police, and, and bring in the federal police. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was an, a figure that I heard that for the first time the other day that uh, there's currently 36,000 federal police, mm -hmm. 36, yeah. 37,000. And that the goal is to try to bring in 100,000 by the end of, of uh, Peña Nieto's administration in the next five years. I mean, and I guess the whole issue also comes down to re-election. Mexico does not have re-election. So what's the in incentive to try to pass these judicial reforms by 2016 if the people who agree to it are no longer in office? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd say, I'd say it's the reverse. The problem is when they passed the judicial reform in 2008, they gave it eight years to be put into place. And so because there's no re-election in Mexico, there was no sitting politician who would be in that seat right. wow. when that reform happened. Now it's 2013. It's three years away. There's lots of people who will be in the seat. The president will be in the seat. The senators will be in their seat. Some mayors will be in the seat, governors. So 2016 will roll around. Either it failed or it didn't or it succeeded. So I think now actually is at the time when there's actually a reason to put your political capital into it when there wasn't in, in 2008. Yeah, and the relationship between uh, Mexico City and the states is, is an interesting one because, of course, you know, in the previous uh, years of pre-rule up until 2000, you know, the fact that Mexico had a pretty strong federalist structure, at least constitutionally, was, was sort of academic because the pre-president ruler of the party would pretty much decide who was going to govern each state and and the governors would report to, to, to the presidency. Um, then, of course, uh, the bond wins the presidency and that system breaks down and everybody kind of is reminded that the, the, state, the states actually have quite a bit of autonomy. 
and and that creates some some interesting frictions and and some more latitude for different state governors and so now we have the return of the pre to the presidency but what you know what happens to that relationship does it go back to if you're a pre-governor do you sort of go back to the 80s and uh, and say you know when the president asks you to do something you, you just sort of salute and say <coughs> si señor presidente or you know are you kind of more accustomed to the fact that hey i have a little bit of of autonomy here. I mean, that dynamic is that because I think that plays itself out quite a bit on a lot of these security matters. Um, do you have a, a, a view on that, okay. Shannon? I mean, so far it's been interesting, right? Because I mean, Peninetta himself knew what it was He's like to be a powerful governor, and and you know, in some ways, moving to Los Pinos to Mexico's White House was was a step down because of the autonomy that that right. you had. You know, now you have to persuade people to come along rather than being governor, where you have you have much more autonomy and direct transfers of money into your budget and less uh, oversight and all of that. And I think this will be the real challenge is how do the pre-governors line up and how, how does that negotiation happen? And he's been pretty smart in many ways. He's brought in a lot of pre-governors or ex-governors into his cabinet, into very prominent positions. So there's a reason to go along in the, in the old way. But, but one thing that's very different is one, there are automatic transfers of monies to the state that didn't happen in the old days where it wasn't as clear. So it's, it's very hard to cut off many of these governors the way you used to in case they, they go off the reservation um, in many ways. And the other thing is you have you know, what economists would call in some ways a moral hazard problem happening right now, which is if the security situation gets bad enough in your state, what will happen is the federal government will come in and intervene and with the federal police and bring all the resources. And you don't pay for any of it. So why would you spend your security budget when you could be spending that money on other things that might be more electorally important right. to you or building up your base or helping out people who have helped you in the past or, you know, or on social programs or things that you care about uh, when you could get, if things get worse, you could get the federal government to pay for your whole security side. And I think that dynamic We've already started to see that in, in, in some of the states. And so how do you change that? And, and that would be important for the president. I mean, one thing you've seen the president try to reassert authority over the states in some of the rules, some of the proposals for the way the fiscal regime is going to work, for some of the um, transparency and accountability at the state level, which hasn't been there before now that Peña Nieto is up in, in, you know, in the executive branch. It's actually important that the states are more transparent than perhaps when he was there and he, right. he enjoyed the leeway to, to not open up, open up the budget to, right. you know, to outside viewers. So it's, it, it's going to be an interesting dynamic as we go forward with the pre-governors and then, of course, the other, the PAN and the PRD government, governors will be more difficult in that sense. Right. I mean, I think there was, a, there was also a sense uh, on the security front that when uh, people voted to pre-back in, uh, at least uh, we did several polls for the, the Dallas Morning News and uh, poll after poll showed that Mexicans felt that the pre-coming back meant going back to the old system, you know, the old accommodation, uh, collusion between cartels and, and the government. And maybe that's still going on, but, I, it, it, but as far as uh, uh, coming up with the PAC, uh, I think uh, at least from people you hear on, on the streets, I mean, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to try to emulate that so soon into his administration. Um, yet, I, I also find it fascinating, I mean, when you look at Tamaulipas, this is a long, long pre-stronghold. Uh, and yet the key places that voted the pre-out, uh, places like uh, Nuevo Laredo, Ciudad Alemán, and there was another one, I, I think it was Matamoros or Reynosa. Uh, I mean, they all, they all voted the bond back in to try to hold the pre accountable. So that's kind of a fascinating you know, dynamic and to look at. And places of incredible violence. Right, Spreading right. Spreading your ballot, yeah. Right. And so do you uh, think, Alfredo, that Peña Nieto's reforms, uh, a lot of the ones that um, Shannon listed, are, uh, are going to succeed? Are they, are they going to be meaningful? Are they going to really sort of <laughs> change Mexico? And, I, and I'd like both of you to talk a little bit about what he's trying to do uh, uh, with the Congress on education and why that's important, and then also a little bit on, on energy, and then we can shift and, and I'm just a questions. reporter. I don't know if they're going to succeed. <laughs> um, it's going to be very chaotic. I mean, I've been, I was in Mexico the last 10 days or so, and uh, just the number of marches that, that are happening. And this is not, we're not even talking about energy reform yet. I mean, we're talking about education. Uh, not just in the uh, Centro Historico and the Zócalo, but in places like Masaric, you know, mm -hmm. Masaric Avenue, the Polanco. Uh, <coughs> I, I mean, I think he will, 
if you look at the numbers, I think he will succeed in, in passing these reforms. Will it help Mexico in, in, in the long term? I hope so. I mean, I, I think that's, that's, that's going to be really the, the real key. Mm -hmm. and, and just for, for those uh, who might not have followed the details too closely, the education reform is, I mean, it's, uh, it's characterized in shorthand as essentially trying to wrest control from, away from the teachers' unions uh, uh, over education a control that, ironically, I suppose, the PRI bestowed on it right. um, in, in the good old days um, in order to have this, this incredibly powerful political base. But the units went to support And uh, then the, the unions, plan. right, yeah. later on, yes. So it's, uh, but is that, is that a fair characterization of, of what the reform is trying to accomplish? Yeah, I mean, it sets basic performance standards. I mean, right now under the old system in Mexico, if you're a governor or a mayor and you want to find out how many teachers are supposed to be in the school in your district, you can't. Right? How many people are supposed to be in the classroom just to see then if they are in the classroom, you can't find that out. It's on a need to know basis. It's on a <laughs> <laughs> which, which you as the governor or the mayor right. or the city council person or, or, a, citizen, are, God yeah, forbid. or a citizen, God forbid, right? Don't need to know, I guess, right? Like who, how many teachers are supposed to be in your kid's school and then do they actually show up and teach? I mean, you don't have access to that information. So it, some of it's as basic as that, as, as that information should be public and then do these people show up and not? And then others are uh, setting up stand, you know, performance standards. So you know, can your math teacher pass a test that they can then teach math? And, and there's also a whole part about revamping the curriculum at some of the, the schools that are supposed to train teachers so that if you don't know how to teach math class or English class, you presumably could go take courses that wouldn't then help you to teach that. Um, on the, I'm just going to say on the reform agenda, which I think is interesting, there's, I mean, there's all these economic reforms out there. and, and Many of them, I do think, you know, if passed, the energy reform and things, depending on what it is, will be really important for Mexico's economy. But the other one that's on the agenda, not put there by Peña Nieto, but put there by their coalition partners, by the PAN, which I think could be fundamentally changing and transforming for Mexico, is a political reform. And so right now, the PAN is trying to negotiate that if we pa go with you on energy reform, you will pass this political reform. And it will do things like it will do a... Uh, um, a runoff if, if uh, in a presidential election if somebody doesn't pass a certain threshold. So you can't win with, you know, 35, 37 percent of the vote. Um, but one thing it would do is probably allow re-election at the local level and up to the, the federal representative level. So mayors can be re-elected, council members can be re-elected. And, and for me, this could, in, you know, looking 10 years out from Mexico or further, this could fundamentally change Mexico. Because the problem right now, especially at the local level, is if you're a mayor, you have a three-year term. So you come into office, and let's say you have the best of intentions. You're a public servant. You believe it. That's why you've run for office. You know, your first year, you're trying to figure out, you know, where the doors are. You're trying to get your cabinet and other people appointed. The second year, you're working really hard to get change things in your district. And the third year, you're looking for your next post. And the way you're going to find your next post is someone in your party is going to nominate you to another political position. So if you want to be a career politician, your future always depends on the head of the, cent the central, you know, the group of the party that decides where everybody goes. It doesn't depend on the people who voted for you. And so if you're trying to make a political career, you don't need to cater to voters, right? And so things that, and also things that take longer than two or three years, like police reform or, you know, judicial reform, those things aren't on your radar screen. Building a bridge or spending money to create construction jobs, that you can do in 18 months or two years. But the other things you can't. And the other thing that happens in Mexico is when you leave and move on as mayor, the next mayor comes in, and that person appoints a new police chief and a new attorney general and a new everyone. So even if these are all really good, talented people, the turnover means you don't have consistency and you aren't able to build up, say, a security system that works. And so that reform, the political reform that's being talked about and being perhaps tied to these economic reforms that the government wants so much, could actually in some ways make a l bigger difference in the long term for Mexico than even energy point. reform. Yeah. It's basically trying to eliminate the, uh, the elusive search for the vessel. You know, you're, you spend all your career looking for that next, uh, that vessel. The bone. Yeah. The bone. <laughs> <laughs> and the energy reform is, is obviously of, of particular significance to the bilateral relationship. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I remember as a kid, you know, the, the, the day that in, in March when the oil companies were expropriated and the, the American oil companies were expropriated and, and other foreign in the 30s was is a holiday. And it's, you know, a uh, cornerstone of the modern constitution <laughs> that the, the oil belongs to the people. And now the reform might open the door to uh, 
foreign investment into the energy sector, uh, which a lot of people argue is, is direly needed because there hasn't been the kind of capital reinvestment in the, in the industry. But, but it is a very touchy subject uh, politically. Is, is this one that, um, that's, that's going to fly? Is he going to get away with that? And is it something that uh, the United States is, is pushing at all? Or is, or is it sort of America, are Americans uh, kind of just not getting involved in that? those conversations? Well, we, we had a poll this weekend uh, in the Dallas Morning News uh, by Via Noble, Austin-based cons uh, consultant firm, that showed that I think 54%, no? 54% of people polled uh, were in favor of the, of the reforms. But I th was it 61 or 62% were not in favor of, of uh, privatization. So that, that uh, shows, you know, the whole dilemma. Uh, yet if you ask people, you know, um, if you bring it to them and you explain the job opportunities and how the oil is really belongs to them and not the government, I think those numbers change. Uh, <coughs> it's, it's one of the things that we're, we're, we're following is, as a Texas newspaper is looking at uh, the explosion of the, um, what's the, the uh, in South Texas, the uh, shale gas, shale? Shale gas. And, and how that extends into places like Coahuila, another straight, uh, Tamaulipas and so forth. Yet those areas are, are controlled by organized crime. And, and so when you, when you ask people in that area, and this is not the poll, but when we did, did the story, uh, that was one of the first things people said is, you know, if it means that uh, we can make this much more efficient, if it means that we can get rid of organized crime and, and get back to the economy, then, then we're all for it. Mexico right now is facing a real quandary in its energy sector in that uh, You've seen production over the last decade decline about 25%. It's stabilized right now, but it looks like it will continue to decline. Uh, and what Pemex, Mexico's state-owned enterprise, knows how to do, the type of things it knows how to do, is not Mexico's future. So when you look at where Mexico has proven reserves or possible reserves, they're in the types of fields that Pemex has no expertise, deep water drilling or shale oil and gas or other unconventional oils. So. How do you increase productivity? And not only is, I mean, oil is less important in the economy than it used to be. It used to be almost 20% of GDP. Now it's about 6 or 7% of GDP. But it's still incredibly important for the federal budget. It's about 35, 40% of the federal budget. So right. if you start seeing oil production decline and perhaps oil prices, which have been, as production has gone down, prices have gone up. So it stabilized the, the budget. But but that may not last forever, as we know, or maybe it will. We'll see. But, but that's something, the volatility there is really worrisome to politicians and to everyone else who wants to provide basic services. So if you ask everyone across the political spectrum, and there are more some, and any time, others in their more candid moments, everybody knows you need to change it. And the amount of money Pemex would need to invest in itself to be able to do the types of exploration and production that it doesn't know how to do mm -hmm. is enormous. Uh, and not there if you actually want to keep funding the government. So this is part of the reason the, the reason you need to open up the oil sector to foreign investment, but perhaps more important even the investment is the expertise. Right. Um, the challenge, though, I would say for Pemex is they go through this. And you look at the vote count and who's on what side, it looks like they can pass this reform. They can pass a constitutional reform. But the challenge is that's probably not enough to bring in the people who have expertise. And you know, a, a warning or a cautionary tale for Mexico is what just happened to Petrobras in Brazil. And so just last week, Petrobras auctioned off its, or, or announced that it was going to start the auction for its biggest deep water fields. That you know, everybody's been talking about this. Back seven years ago, Lula, who's the president, came out and said, you know, God is Brazilian because we found all this oil. It's, you know, we're right up there with Saudi Arabia. They were sure that this was going to go off and be a huge success. And they just got all of the people who were going to bid on it. And they thought 40 people would bid, and only 11 are bidding. And none of the major oil companies, they all said, thanks, mm -hmm. but no thanks. So Exxon is not. BP is not. Chevron is not. Basically, the only companies that are bidding are national oil companies and mostly the Chinese. So and Why is that? Because yeah. the terms, even though it's an open thing, they don't feel like they can make money at it. Right. And I, I was talking with a, a friend of mine who is with one of the big major oil companies, and he said, you know, the problem is, for us, it's not money. We have money. What we don't have is, or what we have a scarcity of our, is human expertise. We have only so many teams that know right. how to do shale oil and gas, or know how to do deep water drilling. And so you're competing, if you're Mexico or Brazil, with should we do it here, or should we do it in North Dakota? 
Should we do it in Tamaulipas or should we, you know, and that is the choice and they only have so many teams. And so as Mexico, I mean, hopefully they open up the sector and it's attractive and, and you get the investment. And I mean, it's interesting, the government of Mexico has done studies, but so have independent studies. And all of them, if this comes off as a success, it could raise Mexico's annual GDP by between 1.5 and 2% a year, which would be a huge increase, right? right? Well, and it's interesting, yeah. It's but, it but this has to happen, right. right? It has to be attractive, right. which and isn't just changing the constitution. Right, yeah. uh, and if, you're, if, you're do if it's hard to just change the constitution, chances are the terms are not mm -hmm. gonna be. And it's interesting right. you mentioned Petrobras because that was Peña Nieto during the campaign when he this started talking about, well, maybe we can revisit this. He yeah. pointed to Brazil as an example of, you know, it's, it's possible to have a state-owned oil company and yet have deals where you can bring in the, f the foreign capital and expertise. And, uh, and he actually used the analogy of, of you know, Nixon yeah. going to China. Like, it would take a pre-president to do yeah. this, uh, you know, just like it would take a, a staunch Republican conservative to open up relations yeah. with China. Um, and, uh, and there's always been this, I mean, it's paradoxical that Mexico, being such an open economy, as you point out, has its control over energy is, is more hermetically sealed off than even Venezuela or Brazil. Or so Cuba. it's kind of, or, or even Cuba. <laughs> Cuba. That's a, that's a different event. It's a different event. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so many other things t uh, I want to ask about, um, but I also am eager to get uh, folks from the audience involved. Um, before we do that, though, just very quickly, Alfredo, your, your book is, is, a, is a, it's a personal story in a way that uh, I, you know, I, I couldn't put it down. I think I, I literally read it in, in one sitting. And uh, for those uh, of, uh, of you who have not had the, uh, the opportunity to read it yet, maybe you could just give us a, a, a little bit of a, of a tease, if you could just talk a, for a few moments about the, your personal journey in addition to what you were describing Mexico has gone through. Um, and I, I also promised I was gonna ask you if it's still midnight in Mexico. <laughs> but talk a little bit just about your, your journey and then we'll open it up to, to questions. Still looking for Don. Uh, my journey is uh, I was born in Mexico, in, in, in Durango, left at the age of six, grew up in California, in the San Joaquin Valley, and I've been a journalist now for almost uh, more than 25 years, 20 of them uh, based in Mexico as a bureau chief for the Dallas Morning News. And I think that's, that's really where the book is based, is looking at it over the last 50 years, but also trying to um, make sense of what went right, what, what went wrong in Mexico during that time. And the challenge was really to try to get off the sidelines as a reporter. I mean, I think we, we get very comfortable as journalists, to, you know, asking people questions and so forth. But suddenly, it really came down to, to you, to trying to tell a, a journalistic story. I mean, I think I, I've lived through the most turbulent years in Mexico. I was, I was listening to Andres uh, and his time in Chihuahua. And I thought about uh, Chihuahua back in the 1980s and the whole movement for the, uh, the, the change, political change and so forth. But the challenge for me was really to try to, to write a book with the benefit of distance. Uh, I, I live in Mexico City, but I go back and forth. And it was, in many ways, it was kind of like um, as a member of the diaspora, the immigrant diaspora in the United States, try to write about the tragic beauty of, of the homeland. Um, and to try to do it in, in a personal level. So it took a lot of music and a lot of uh, soundtracks and so forth to try to bring back those memories, bring back those moments. And it took a lot of tequila to try to really feel, uh, feel that. I mean, in, in, in some ways, it's kind of like carrying the, uh, the weight of two countries. Uh, <clears throat> Midnight in Mexico, I mean, the, the name came as Midnight because it was after the, uh, the fourth death threat. And one of these darkest moments of your life when you're sitting there and you're wondering, did I do the right thing in coming back to Mexico? <clears throat> and at that moment, you're, you're thinking, the only thing you're, you, you want to believe in is in the promise of a new day. So when the, the agent publishers came back and said, uh, you know, we want you to write a book, my first suggestion was uh, Midnight in Tenochtitlan. Didn't fly. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I eventually came down with Midnight in Mexico. This is before Midnight in Paris. Okay, <laughs> uh, and I thought, you know, at that point, I thought uh, we've lost it; it's over. But they they actually stuck with that, and uh, so is it is it uh, is it still midnight? I really want to believe that there was a dawn, 
and I and and I do believe that there is a dawn. Uh, I think it's maybe two, three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and in Mexico City, the nights are very, very long. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> A ver, preguntas, comentarios, sir. Oh, and please, um, yeah, wait for a microphone and uh, and identify yourself. This is being webcast, so we want to have a microphone. So you're in the second row. So. Thanks. My name is Antonioti. I spent a number of years with the World Bank. I want to ask if you could help us understand the politics of the pact. Mm. Why did we get a pact now? and not before. Presumably any administration of the last 20 years would have been happy to have had this kind of arrangement to put these kind of reforms through. So question one, why do we get it now and not before? Question two, how durable will it be? Uh, how long before they feel they have to uh, hive off in different directions to prepare for the next election? Mm -hmm. Good question. What? The reason it was possible to me is that it's because the PRI is back. The PRI, for the 12 years it was out, had no incentive to form a pact with the PAN or others and show that those, those parties uh, could govern. Um, they wanted to show that they were the only ones who can govern. And that's back what they ran on last, last year around was, you know, you might like us, you might not like us, you might have worries about us, but we know how to govern. Um, while the PAN does not look at, the, look at the violence, look at the economy, look at other things. So that's the reason it didn't happen before is because the PRI wasn't interested in pacting. In fact, many of the reforms Peña Nieto is trying to push forward now, uh, the PRI vetoed, and you know, some would say actually he is one of the most important people in the, in the party uh, when they were out of power, probably personally vetoed, um, now that he has it on his agenda. So that's why they're in it. But the so question is why are the PRD and why the PAN in it now? You know, I would say the PAN in particular is in it uh, because, well, ideologically they believe in a lot of these things. Um, two, they were decimated by the last election, so they're a bit fragile at this point. And so it's, it's not everybody in the PAN that agrees with this, but, it, but there's some elements who see it as advantageous to hook onto this. Uh, and three, they feel if they want to come back in governorships and then finally the presidency, uh, they can't be seen as doing nothing, as putting, you know, as not ideologically getting done what they want to do. For so long, but even before they came to the presidency, they said they wanted energy reform, they said they wanted tax reform, they wanted education, they want all these things. So they can't be seen, if they want to be electorally viable down the road, they can't be seen as voting against these things. Um, because it, it's, they're supposedly a, a platform party, right? They're, they're a party with a real platform, and so you can't vote against your platform. So I think there's a reason there. You can only have one blatantly cynical party. That exactly. That's what I'm saying, right? You can only have one that says we're all just about power and right. nothing else, right? This umbrella party. They actually think they have an ideology. And then on the, on the PRD side, there's a pragmatic part of the PRD, a smaller part, but that's the one who also is saying perhaps we can gain electorally and in our personal strength in our, this part of the party by signing on and being part of this change, right? Working with the, the PRI rather than working against them. I mean, there's big, big parts of the, right. the PRD that have said no, Lopez Obrador being the most, you know, his right. being the most vociferous on that, but, but so, has, so have many others, Cardenas and others have, so that part, it's part of it. How long does it last? I say it doesn't have all, I mean, it, it will get through the end of this year, maybe the beginning of next year, but once you start preparing for midterms, once you start thinking about that, I think it's very hard to hold the center. And frankly, for, for Peña Nieto, if all of this stuff happens by the end of the year, the 120 days he gave in his State of the Union to get all this done, how useful the pact, the pact may be less useful for the PRI as well, as they gear up for elections and want to be running against, against other candidates. So as a reporter, you think, uh, you think by the end of the year, all the reforms will pass? I'm just trying to plan ahead. <laughs> 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 when you need to be Mexico to write your right. stories. I think there's a good possibility that many of the economic ones, I think fiscal and energy, and, and probably financial. Education. Well, they passed it. It's done, right? Right. Right. So, um, and then the secondary round for energy, I don't know if that'll be by the end of the year, but I think it'll, they'll start talking about it, right. assuming it goes through. It does feel like a lot of the energy we're seeing, um, and I really, I, I characterized it as Peña Nieto doing X, Y, or Z, but, but part of the energy does feel that it's sort of like a big destape because for the 12 years you did not have a governing majority in the Congress with, with three factions, neither one of them, a and now you, you do um, f for the reasons you alluded to. That it, it would have been too jarring of a turnaround for the PAN to suddenly be opposing all the things that, I mean, that's the kind of thing we see in Washington. But, <laughs> but, 
but it might have been too jarring uh, for, for, for Mexican audiences. And so it's, there's an opportunity here. But it is an interesting dynamic, which, um, sir? Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Rick Reedy. I, in the 1970s, I had the fortune, good fortune to study it in Mexico City for a couple of years, like these young people, I suppose. Um, and so I've been going back there ever since. And we've been talking about all the micro or the macro questions, and I think people are pretty much in agreement. But micro, the change in individuals. Back in the 1970s, you paid the cop a little bit of money so he didn't give you a traffic ticket. Now, the level of corruption, every single one of my classmates from university, their families have been threatened, uh, people have been uh, express kidnapped. The level of corruption is down to the point where my driver in Mexico City, who owns three taxis, was called a few weeks ago and the person on the end of the phone threatened his family and knew exactly how much cash he had deposited in the bank yesterday. So presumably it was a teller or someone who called someone. And my question to you three is the, the macro changes are all fantastic, but the decay, mm -hmm. probably because there aren't other jobs, but for lots of other reasons, has, has really taken root in a way that I, I'm shocked. And I spend a lot of time in Mexico City. And I wondered if you could comment on, on, the, on the micro what are you corruption. Thinking? Sure. I mean, I, I also think that the, uh, the corruption is, is being exposed a lot more. And I think in part due to social media. I mean, I, I find it fascinating the, the number of videos you now see or the number of people sharing, uh, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or, or YouTube, uh, people paying you know, bribes and so forth. Uh, I, I'll tell you one anecdote that, that shocked me. Uh, and little, little shocks me in Mexico these days, but this one really, really blew me away. Uh, as, a, as a Mexico City resident, you have to change your, your sticker, no, your car sticker every six months, I think, or so forth. <coughs> Long story short, the, the, the guy who was doing my car gets pulled over by the police, and they, uh, they, they take my car. The guy calls me up and says, Alfredo, we have a problemita. <laughs> uh, fíjese. Fíjese. And I said, ¿qué es el problemita? And he explains to me, and I said, that's a problemota. <laughs> uh, and I said, you know, very kind of natural. I said, ¿cuánto? And he says, five. So I sh show up at the police station, I think it's 500 pesos. Uh, and th they have Samuel, the, the driver outside, and he's there. Um, he's there with the cops. And I'm kind of, this is kind of a odd little thing, you know, why is he not inside the police station and so forth? So I go over, I talk to him, and I said, uh, perdón, you know, you apologize, and you say, you know, I'm so sorry that this happened. It's oversight on my part. <coughs> How much is it going to take? And he says, uh, and I said, so what's the procedure now? He says, well, you know, we can put him in jail. And it might take you months, maybe years, to see him again. Or we can resolve this among ourselves. And I said, well, you know, all I have is 300 pesos. Because you always kind of want to go, you know, you're going to have to negotiate. And the guy just looked at me and laughed and laughed. And he says, no, 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 no. This is going to take 10,000 pesos. I think it was different, you know. I literally only had 600 pesos in my pocket. So you go back, back and forth, back and forth, and I realized that they were serious. They were about to take Samuel, and I said, you know, let me have a, a second with them. I said, Samuel, five, what do you mean by five? He says, 5,000 pesos. And so I pulled him back, and I, and I called, um, I said, let me call uh, an attorney friend of mine to try to see if I can get the money. And I turned my iPhone on, and I taped the whole transaction. And I kept saying, perdón, how much money was that? And he's telling me, you know, very blatantly, it's, it's fine. Well, he says, well, we can, we can go down to 6,000. We finally went down to five, which is a magic number. I said, you know what? Seriously, I don't have 5,000 pesos. I have, I have six. He says, well, we'll take you to the, the we will escort you to the bank and the take the money. <laughs> very efficient. It was only just a few blocks from there. And they did that. And as we, as we got to the, uh, the front of the bank, uh, they, uh, the guard who was there says, echale ojo. And I'm taping the whole thing. Uh, I take the money out, pay him. I said, perdón, con quien tuve el gusto? You know, who did I have the pleasure with? And they, you know, they say, you know, el Sargento Martinez, el Sargento Salgado, blah, blah, it's all taped. 
<clears throat> pay them, get into the car, I tell Samuel, listen, I know this was a tough, tough day for you, but we have it on tape. We can just put it on YouTube, we can put it on Facebook, we can put it on Twitter, like millions of Mexicans, or maybe not millions, but a lot of Mexicans are doing it these days. And he, he, he just said no. He said, uh, I don't belong to the middle class. You know, they know my name, they, know, they have my address. So I think, I mean, yes, I think, I think it's corruption that's being exposed a lot more, but I also think there are some limitations to, uh, you know, some, maybe, maybe it's, it's becoming more and more tower, I'm, uh, of a pattern. I mean, I, I look at the uh, news every day, and I'm always looking for that little column about uh, corruption caught on tape and so forth. Uh, but it's definitely much more widespread than I than I think when when I was growing up, and, or when I when I started in Mexico as a correspondent. I think it definitely is um, the biggest uh, speed bump to Mexico's development. It's kind of the I think more so than crime and insecurity. Where I'm kind of optimistic in the long term. I mean, they're related, though, because I think it, one feeds on the other, and it's sort of this corrosion of the rule of law, which then spills over into other ways. And I, I think it's that every it's very day. Sad. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, was, I was talking to people in, in Ciudad Juarez, for example, and, and you think of extortions as just the top business people that are being hit. I mean, more and more you hear from people shining shoes or people running a taqueria stand, and it's something like 50 pesos a week, 75 pesos a week, 100 pesos a week. Uh, I mean, it... it um, it impacts on a very, very local, daily basis. Yeah. Um, there was a question in the back. Yeah. Oh, I know you. <laughs> Get that. Um, huh? Okay, hi. Uh, Ricardo Sandoval, a former colleague of Alfredo's at the Morning News in Mexico. He's also in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm still waiting for my royalty. Then. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, the following up on the question on the, on the corruption, I think that's a, it's, it's a fundamental question in there was a figure cited about the GDP potential with the new uh, energy sector uh, reforms. I, I think a lot of that, I mean, some of that could be generated just by a massive undertaking to clean up, you know, some substantial levels of the government. And so that leads to a question about the relationship between the U.S. and Mexico on security. With the new administration, I'm wondering if, if there's a level of trust that had some nascent, had some beginnings in the previous administration, previous administrations. Uh, if that was all just torn up by the by the pre, by the most uh, recent presidential election, uh, where are we with that? Um, and, and did it did twelve years of a different government yield us anything when it comes to making some honest headway uh, in in the fight against corruption? And in in the overall security um, comfort level of uh, of comfort between the two countries. That's a good question. Do we essentially like start over each time, Shannon? What do you think? I mean, we have an eight-year plan every six years. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would say the level of trust, even under the Calderon government, there you would measure this not at the top level, but you'd measure it at the mid to lower level. I mean, that's where, where trust really developed was pe person to person, agent to agent, or officer to officer, or the like. And that, you know, as Alfredo, you know, illuminated before, some of that's still happening. It may be informal, it might not be as formal as it was before, where you had, you know, the green light from above. But I think some of that is, is continuing, that back and forth. Uh, so that would be the, you know, the optimistic side is whatever happens in Washington and Mexico City in the offices of, you know, the Ministries of the Interior or Homeland Security, yes, it matters, but really where trust matters is at a very different level. Um, and, and that, I don't think, has changed as dramatically. And the question, though, would be is does Washington and Mexico City, do they come around? It's been sort of a slow startup, I would say. Do they come around to working together pretty closely on stuff? or not. And while I still, as Alfredo, when I talk to people on both sides of, of, uh, of the relationship and ask them, well, what, what is your security strategy? And they kind of, you know, they're a little bit vague and we're going to do this and that, and that. But one thing that's still a big part of it, it seems, from both sides is intelligence and, and working together on intelligence. And that presumably would trust matters for sharing of intelligence. So if they both are pushing that forward. Perhaps you don't lose. We haven't lost six or 12 years, but, but it's, it's, it's evolving rather than, than totally dissipating or, or, or breaking. 
from the past. And actually, just to sort of reinforce what, what Alfredo was saying, um, what I found actually quite interesting over the last 10 months, I guess, of the Peña Nieto administration is every time I open up the paper in Mexico, there's some big scandal story about a governor, doesn't matter what party, there's a big scandal story about a union leader or a large business or the like, that they're out there. And all of these details of, of you know, the planes and the houses and the this Neiman and the that. Marcus and the Neiman Marcus <laughs> charges and, and, and all of the like. And, and that to me is something very new in Mexico. And partly that comes from things like the Freedom of Information Act that Vicente Fox passed and then using it. I mean, those are, those are pretty big steps forward. I mean, we think about it as like, oh, it's not a big deal, but it is a big deal, right, to actually have that information. Um, so that's the, you know, moving forward side. What I haven't seen yet uh, is any of these cases lead to a conviction. In fact, there was something I saw in the news this morning that maybe El Bestro Gordillo, the teachers union, that her case is starting to fall apart. Right. And it's like, really? You don't have the capacity <laughs> to hold together one case of someone that, I mean, everybody at least, you know, anecdotally knows she didn't, you know, buy all those things and carry an Hermes bag on a teacher's salary. I mean, how could you not build a case against it? Or how could, you know, this is your one chance and you've, you may be messing it up. So what does worry me there is, is either it's corruption or it's just the lack of capacity on her side to, to prosecute someone successfully. And if you can't do that, then having these cases across the front pages of all the newspapers, after a while you right. get very cynical about it. Let me just follow up a little bit on uh, Ricardo's question. Uh, one of the, speaking of um, intelligence and trust uh, among governments, uh, one of the revelations that came out of a lot of the sort of NSA uh, uh, leaks of, of, uh, that we all are familiar with of late had been that the fact that uh, you know, US, the U.S. agencies were able to uh, listen in on some of Peña Nieto's personal conversations while he was uh, running for the presidency. As they were listening in on his cell phone com calls. Um, other, there have been other revelations, obviously, about other countries, most notoriously in the last few weeks. Uh, there, you know, Brazilian, Brazil's president canceled a visit to Washington for this very reason. Postponed. Um, postponed, yes, <laughs> postponed. Excuse me for my lack of, of diplomatic tact. Um, <laughs> You know, in Mexico, how this story, uh, you know, I haven't, I haven't been in Mexico in a few months, but this story, how did it play, and, and, and is, there, is there not the level of outrage that people in Brazil feel? And, and there, there really wasn't. Yeah. There really wasn't. I mean, that, I think that was one of the sh shocking things is how it, it really became a big deal in Brazil, but in Mexico, even, I mean, the administration kind of downplayed it. People kind of thought, well, what, did, you know, what else is new? <laughs> I mean, this has been going on probably for, forever. Uh, and you talk to U.S. intelligence people, and they say, "Yeah, was, we've been doing it for a while. We just got caught." You know, so I, I don't know if it was Peña Nieto's way of saying "me la deben," uh -huh. or or just you know kind of shrug it off. Because uh, I think both sides yeah. use use intelligence. Uh, so, because it was it, it, when the Wiki, when we had the WikiLeaks uh, revelations a couple years ago, the Calderon government really kind of right. you know got in got in a in a in a in a state and it. it you know, cost the uh, U.S. ambassador at the time uh, his job. And so the contrast has been interesting, not just between the way some of these revelations are, are playing out in places like Brazil and Mexico, but even between WikiLeaks and, and this. And this is a, a very personal in invasion, I imagine, right. if you're Peña Nieto. So maybe there's some private conversations about, dude, stop listening to the phone calls. <laughs> um, sir. Um. Fernando Damian, international investor. Uh, thanks. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Alfredo, for mentioning the Bajio. Oh. <laughs> um, because I'm from Querétaro, and we got a really nice aerospace cluster developing there. It's a really economic boost. I need your card. <laughs> <laughs> well, for my question, um, do you think that the objective of Peña Nieto's reforms are more to increasing the federal budget in cost of competitiveness of the industrial and private sector, and begin this in the energy reform and more for the proposal of the fiscal one. I think the taxes are not uh, suggesting a, a foster to the, com to the industrial part. Hmm. I mean, my view on the on the fiscal reform is that the Peña Nieto's administration they made the calculation that they really wanted to get energy reform. 
they needed to do some sort of fiscal reform, but they couldn't do a, they couldn't get both. They couldn't get big fundamental fiscal and energy reform. So they decided to go for energy and do a fiscal reform, but not one that would fundamentally change the the structure. So they didn't put in the general the EVA, the the value added tax across the board, which many people had wanted. You know, sort of more market oriented. Um, they didn't really change a lot of of the overall structure of of the fiscal regime because they just felt like they couldn't get both. So I would imagine, let's say, all of these reforms are, are successful. They're going to increase spending, which is one thing that you know, the fiscal reform will do. You, we may be revisiting fiscal reform in a, in a few years, probably after midterm elections. We might be revisiting it to, to reshape it in a way. So I think it, if you look at sort of fundamental changes and where they might go, you know, telecommunications potentially could be a fundamental change. Education reform potentially could be a fundamental change. Energy, yes, I don't think this fiscal reform is a is a fundamental you know, transformation. And if energy reform happens, depending on how it is, you may need a big fiscal reform, a big change, because some of the energy money won't be flowing into the, the government. Um, and also because production with foreign investment isn't going to come online for many, many years, even if they start tomorrow. And again, the impetus for fiscal reform has always been the idea that uh, uh, the tax receipts, the percentage of the economy that goes to, towards tax receipts in Mexico is is quite low. Right. I think it's the lowest of any it's OECD country. And it's the so lowest of OECD, and second only to Guatemala okay. in Latin America, Latin which America. is you know probably not the the, the, the crowd yeah. you want to be running with. <laughs> um, <laughs> other questions, Constantine in the back. Yeah, thanks. I'm Constantine. I'm a I'm a fellow here. Um, other than Andres's plans to, to open a taqueria where you know I want to get a job slicing the tacos al pastor, <laughs> um, you guys want to partner with me? We'll we'll talk later. All right. <laughs> you guys managed not to talk very much about uh, immigration, uh, which seems to me sort of one of the most striking structural changes in the last five years or so. That you had a flow of hundreds of thousands of people a year that has fallen to you know close to zero. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit, I guess, on how you disaggregate the causes of this. To what extent is it purely a reflection of the slowdown in the US economy, of the sort of border security stuff of the right wing in this country? To what extent is it's a reflection of dynamics within Mexico? And then sort of following that, sort of how lasting a change do you see this being? And what do you see its implications uh, for Mexico? Uh, you mentioned that briefly, talking about the the workers in Querétaro who, you know, who aren't thinking of going as much, uh, but is that going to be also true in, you know, in states that, like, you know, Oaxaca, Zacatecas, that have been traditionally sort of more migrant uh, areas? Mm -hmm. Thanks. I mean, I, I think it's all three factors. I mean, you talk to Mexicans uh, mm -hmm. about why they're not going as much as they used to. I mean, you know, first is the fertility, right? With seven to two, seven babies to versus two. But a lot of people will also talk about <coughs> just how difficult it is, just the danger of crossing the Mexican border. I mean, the, the fact that the Zetas are really much more than a cartel. I mean, it's much more of an organized criminal organization. And they control these routes, smuggling routes. That's a big factor. Uh, when, when they discover all these bodies, in clandestine graves in, in Tamaulipas, uh, we were interviewing people in Guanajuato, in Solis Potosí, and buses were literally leaving empty. I mean, that, that was a, 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 a big fear. Then you have the whole U.S. border security. You know, that may also has made it much more difficult. And then the, the U.S. economy. Although the Texas economy has, has in really had the, the same slowdown as the overall U.S. economy. Uh, but th I think those were big, big factors. I mean, to the point where some, Mexi I mean, some employers in, the U in Texas are beginning to ask, you know, what happens if tomorrow we don't have enough Mexicans? Uh, what happens to the economy? What, what do we bring people in? Let me just add a couple of things on that are interesting. One is, as Alfredo says, the, the demographic numbers and just the average kids per family and how that's trailed off. And when you look versus the 1990s when you saw this big inflow, there's probably somewhere between a, uh, like a hundred, between 100 and 200,000 just fewer kids turning 18 each year. So that's 100, 200,000 people that don't need to go into any job market, whether they are on this side of the border. The other big change over the last 20, 25 years is the number of years kids stay in school, and it's doubled. 
So if you're a 14 or 15 year old, you're much more likely now to think about going on to 10th or 11th grade than should I, where's my job prospects? So it at least delays the immigration decision. And then if you're finishing high school and even, you know, there's 3 million Mexicans now in college. So if you're thinking about that, you're delaying the idea of, of, of immigrating and perhaps then also perhaps finding a job in, in Mexico instead. And then the third interesting thing I think is sort of the numbers that we keep is just people aren't moving back and forth as often as they were before, so the counts end up differently. And um, there's some surveys that were done. They started in the 1990s, and they asked there, you know, if you're here in the United States, how often do you go back? And 50% of Mexicans said they would go back to Mexico within a year, and 75% said they would go back to Mexico within two years. So in the 90s, there really was circular migration. You come for several months, and then you go back. Now the same survey you ask, and you ask, you know, will you go back this year? And it's somewhere between. 10 and 15 percent that go back in the same year that they come. So, I mean, a huge decrease. So people are coming and staying for longer or just staying. And so I think that also changes when we're trying to measure these flows. It, it changes it, and partly because of the security issues. Partly they're entering sectors that aren't as seasonal, um, right? They're no longer doing agriculture. They're in services or other things. So you don't leave when the harvest is done. But partly it's so costly oh, yeah. to get across the border. Why would you leave? That's one of the saddest things that I find as a, as a reporter when I mean, you're covering this issue and you're traveling through Guanajuato in some of these states, Zacatecas, and the number of kids who have not met their dads or, or their moms. Um, I mean, when I was growing up in Mexico, my father was a bracero, a guest worker. I didn't really know I had a father, but I knew that every December the man would show up. And you know he had gifts and so forth. You don't you don't find that anymore with the, with the, in a lot of these regions in in Mexico. I mean that back and forth. I think we have time for one more question. If there is one. Yes, sir. Mike Tess. All right. Uh, good morning. I'm William from AU. Um, I'm just wondering. Because you mentioned that uh, there are reforms in the energy sector, but you mentioned that human capital, lack of t uh, technical expertise is one trouble. And I was just wondering if perhaps the U.S. could hypothetically uh, organize an exchange of services or an exchange in like um, some exchange program that will help to increase, say, um, human capital development in those oil drilling um, uh, fields in Mexico because the thing is that um, Mexico is the third biggest US supplier of oil and that shale gas production is probably going to increase to like 46% um, by 2035 mm -hmm. so I mean the US has a big stake in it and I was just wondering um, what are your comments about it? I mean part the US hasn't done it as of yet because oil and energy in Mexico is such a touchy subject as Andres laid out. And in fact, in the, in the debates now, it, I mean, it's interesting. When President Bi uh, Vice President Biden was just down in Mexico last on Friday, and you know, he didn't say anything about energy, and Benito didn't say anything about immigration. It's like, you guys work it out in your own countries, right? And, and everybody's you know, agreed to be quiet on those issues. So uh, you know, if, if the United States were to come out and say, oh, we'd love to train people in the oil sector, you can imagine right now, it's a very sensitive issue. Um, they did actually, the, the President and Vice President Biden uh, announced that they will be doing many more educational exchanges. And so one could imagine, uh, and Mexico actually has this big initiative, they want to um, send 100,000 people to study in the United States by... Um, because it's by staggering how few yeah. do. So I mean, few. countries like, I think Mexico ranks 15th or something. Yeah. I looked at the figures in the recently. Double digits. In terms of the number of, of foreign students in the U.S. You know, there's so much attention and effort placed in, in bringing graduate students from uh, China and you know Southeast Asia and other parts of the world and I think there's there's been a neglect I mean to the extent f just given how integrated the two economies have become and the proximity uh, there's been a real neglect in terms of you know what you're talking about more broadly which is a sort of human exchange and 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 a broader kind of engagement on, on the part of civil society to connect the way that the economies are connecting. And I think partly, partly it's just a question of, I think people figure that'll just sort of happen on its own. You don't, it, you know, the, there's, there's been less of a need. I think there's been a perception that there's less of a need for a formalized channel than you might have with some other countries because, because we've got NAFTA and because families are going back and forth. But when you look at the number of, of Mexican graduate students in US universities, it's it's do you know the number? It's like twenty thousand or something. Yeah, it's really low. It's pr it's it's, it's quite low. 
Um, so more of that would be good. And, and on the question of the U.S. oil companies getting too directly involved, it, it is, it's, it's very sensitive. I mean, I think there will be matters of a concession. And, uh, uh, there are other ways of going about it. But I, I was sort of uh, amused a couple of years ago. I was in Mexico City, and there was a, a lot of fanfare uh, that the, uh, I think it was the Prince of Norway was, was in town. And there was a huge delegation of the Norwegian state, state oil company and they were engaged in, in, in talks with Pemex, and, and I don't know what that led to or didn't lead to. But there are other uh, potential partners that might be less politi politically sensitive, because in you know, the 1930s, when the oil companies were expropriated, they were not Norwegian oil companies. Um, so there, you know, there's other, other ways to tap into uh, you know, human capital there. Um, well, there are lots of other subjects we could tackle, but I'm afraid we've, we've hit our, our time limits, because I'd fellow, among other things, has to c catch a plane. Uh, but thank, thanks to both of you. This has been fantastic. And thank, thank you, you all for coming. Thanks. <laughs> to be continued. <laughs>